Hey guys, this is Ron. So in this series of videos, I'm going to talk a little bit about the C programming language. And the reason that I've decided to do this is I've hit a, little, a few projects at work uh, where I have to do a little bit of low level development. And because of that, I find myself having to relearn C again after many years. Um, so uh, what better time than to do some videos about C uh, to also help keep myself sharp and to hopefully pass along a few things uh, to you as well. So in this video, uh, if I can move quick enough, it'll take maybe 40-ish, 45 minutes. We'll cover um, setting up our development environment um, so that if you want to follow along, you uh, will have the same environment that I do. So this is Ubuntu 20.04. It is a fresh, clean install. Um, the only things I've done to it is I did some updates and I installed VS Code. But um, you don't have to use VS Code. You can use you know terminal, whatever. We're going to kind of walk through those options. So in here, I'll show you. Yeah, like I said, I did install VS Code, but that was literally just going to uh, Ubuntu software coming up doing a search for VS code and when it shows up clicking on it and clicking install so it was fairly straightforward fairly easy uh, to get on Ubuntu uh, the only other thing you may want to do uh, with VS code is to install the C C++ uh, extensions uh, to do that uh, you just bring up VS code you have this extensions section you click on it here at the top there should be C and C++ so you just click install it'll download the plugin install it and you're good to go all right so now you can use uh, VS code to you know write C code and it will help you along the way now if you're uh, feeling more like doing most of it on the terminal which is perfectly fine um, it's the way I tend to prefer things unless I'm doing a, a larger uh, bit of cleanup. I tend to use Vim, you can use Emacs, uh, whatever. Um, I'm not gonna get into that argument because uh, I believe in not feeding trolls. Uh, so anyway, let's go ahead and check out what we currently have installed as far as Vim. What we'll find is that Vim is not installed. Instead, we have VI. And in my opinion, VI is a little bit rough. So if we do like a pound include stdio.h, so this is a standard header file within C. Uh, notice we don't have any syntax highlighting. Um, we can do uh, our main function. Notice we don't have indentation. Um, if I mistype and I hit backspace, uh, it doesn't erase it until I hit exit and go back to command mode but I can't see that I'm in command mode so I have to hit escape a bunch of times just not my cup of tea when it comes down to it so if we quit uh, so colon Q uh, exclamation point says quit and don't save we can do uh, sudo apt uh, install them If I could type my password correctly, nope. I meant to type it to set it to something easier prior to this video, but this is the second or third time I've gone through this due to other foreseen issues. But uh, anyway, here we are. Uh, Vim is now installed. So now if we go, uh, that basically shortcuts uh, VI uh, to actual Vim. So VI will do a hello.c. And this time, if I hit I, notice in the bottom left, it automatically says, hey, you're in insert mode, which is cool. And I do a pound include stdio.h. We now see syntax highlighting in main. We're not going to pass anything to our main. Automatic indentation. When I mistype and I hit backspace, cool. So little things like that I find to be super useful. Um, so let's go ahead and finish this little uh, C program. We'll just do hello developers, uh, carriage return, 
Don't worry if you don't understand this code yet, because we'll definitely go over it. Uh, but essentially, this is a very small C program. Um, I hit escape to get back to command mode, colon WQ to write and quit. All right, so that's starting to look good. Um, but with your typical editors, you like to see things like line numbers. If I go back into there and I do a colon, I can do a set number. Automatically, I have numbers, and there are other niceties that you can kind of put in here. The point is, is I don't want to have to put set number every time. Every time I go into Vim, I want to make sure it's done that way. So I'll do a colon Q to exit. And this time, within my home directory, I'm going to create something called a Vim RC file. And here's where I'm going to set some of those uh, defaults. So if I look, I've got an example beside me that I typically use. Uh, I'll do a set number. I'll do a set tab stop uh, equals four. So instead of being eight spaces like it was before, I just set it to four, which makes it easier. Uh, your lines don't get so long uh, when you're you know, using tabs. Set shift width equals four. Honestly, don't remember what that one is, um, but it's typically something I put in uh, into my Vim RC file. And then Smart Indent, which Vim was kind of already doing for us, but I put it in there. Now, when we do a VI uh, into our hello.c, automatically we have line numbers and we have four spaces uh, instead of the eight. Even though it's still just a tab, it only moves it over four spaces, which is which is what we want. Uh, C doesn't require tabs, but I like to put them in there because it makes it easier to read. Okay, so now we know every time we go in and out of Vim, it's gonna be set up the same way. Now, there are other things we can do to our Vim RC file um, that put it more in line with, um, instead of being just the text editor, it kind of gets into the realm of being a full on um, kind of like VS Code is where it has all this extra functionality. So if we look, I'm not going to do it this uh, round, but you're more than welcome to go and look at it and, and maybe I'll do it in a future video. But there's things called, uh, you know, bundle is one of the ways to get plugins into Vim. And so you basically can clone this repo um, and then um, you end up doing, you update your Vim RC file to to say which plugins you want, uh, you do some plugin installs inside of Vim. It's really not that difficult to get set up. And there are tons and tons of plugins if you want. Uh, I personally only use maybe three or four. Um, if I look at my um, Vim RC file that I typically use, I'll use a plugin called Syntastic, uh, Nerd Tree. Uh, Git Gutter, uh, Ale, um, Nerd Commenter. So there's a couple of things in there. First off, Syntastic does a little bit better highlighting. Um, some of the plugins you can use to auto compile your code. And so you'll find syntax errors faster that way. So in, you don't find the syntax errors when you finally go to compile it. It's happening automatically within Vim. And so Vim will then, you know, Put a little squiggly line underneath of that spot in your code so you know to go back and look at it. So again, just niceties to have, uh, but definitely not required. Uh, but that's how uh, I got those, you know, func that functionality into uh, Vim. All right. So again, not going to cover it, but so you're more than more than uh, uh, you can definitely go and check this out if you want. All right. So that is getting Vim up and running. So if I go back here, we've now installed Vim. We updated our Vim RC to get a more uh, consistent environment that looks a little bit better. Now we'll talk a little bit about GDB. GDB is what we'll use for debugging our code. Um, and so let's go ahead and compile our hello program so we can actually debug it. So the way that we would compile that in here we'll do it with the GCC compiler and we would typically do that with attack O so this is output hello 
low.c, so this is the file we're bringing in, and it tells us by default it doesn't have it installed. So let's install sudo apt install gcc. So this will go ahead, install or download, install uh, gcc, and then uh, once it's complete, we'll just hit the up arrow, and that'll go ahead and install, um, or that'll go ahead and compile our hello program. All right, so there we are. Hit the up arrow twice, and we've compiled our program. We can look, and we now have not only hello.c, but we have hello with an asterisk, which tells us that this is an executable. All right, and so we dot slash hello, and it works. All right, now if for whatever reason, it didn't quite work correctly, we might want to debug that. Now, we didn't add any kind of extra debugging, so what we'll see is assembly code, but we can do gdb hello. Now, we know that we wrote a main function, so we can tell gdb to disassemble the main function. And what we see is the assembly code for that. Now, this assembly code, the syntax for it has these percent symbols in it uh, and you'll see some others that is very indicative of AT&T syntax and I'm not a fan of AT&T syntax but luckily we can get rid of that um, we can do like a debt set disassemble flavor I think flavor nope not frame assemble flavor there it is Intel and now if I up arrow and look at it great it looks a little bit better to me this and again if you don't know assembly code it's fine we're not really going to cover it too much because this is C but for debugging purposes we can see that we're setting up a stack here we're referencing some memory address here and loading it load effective address into the RDI register and we're calling the puts function. Well, we actually called printf in our program, but when it was compiled, because we weren't passing a lot of uh, different uh, functionality to it, GCC shortened it and called the simpler puts function. So puts only looks for an address in the RDI register and prints that out to the screen. Well, that address happens to point to our string uh, hello developers so that's how hello developers gets to the screen this is our zero getting loaded into our return and then it returns so we return zero at the end of our function so that's pretty much the the function that we wrote but it's a slightly nicer syntax than the at t stuff up here um, so let's go ahead and make sure every time we get into um, gdb that it does that automatically and so very much like the vimrc file that we did we can do a vi into our home directory of gdb in it and we'll just go ahead and insert Control shift v to paste that in escape colon wq to write and quit and now the next time we go into gdb we're already in intel syntax right so that's one thing that we can do to make gdb a little bit nicer now another thing that we can do which i won't do in this example uh, is we can load in something like the gdb enhanced features gef jeff whatever you want to call it there's also uh pwn debug there's also um gdb paida that all kind of uh set up a slightly nicer interface so instead of us just seeing our disassembly code we not only see that but we'll see the c syntax if we included that when we compiled it we'll also see how our stack is currently laid out and we'll see what's currently loaded in our registers so this is typically set up for when you're trying to do some reverse engineering but it also comes in super handy when you're debugging your own code because you can step through it line by line and see how the memory addresses are changing how the registers are changing how your stack is changing 
super helpful. But again, those, that's, those are extra niceties that you don't necessarily need just to write some C. All right, so that was setting up GCC in order to compile a program and look at it inside of GDB. Which, so I got these slightly out of order, but we compiled with GCC and we looked at it with GDB. All right, so the now, uh, the next point is we'll set up Git. Git is how we're going to do our uh, source code management. So what is Git? Oh, that sent me to Git. Oh, no. Git. So should tell me how Git is an open source distributed version control system, right? So it's good. It's how we're going to track changes to the software that we write, right? So cool. Well, how do we get it up and running? So let me quit out of here. Uh, we will do a folder called projects. We'll go into that and we'll do a git init. Oh, not git init. Git init. And it tells me git's not currently installed. So let's install. sudo app install git. And so number of packages have to be downloaded uh, and installed. And so if everything works correctly, now when I do a git init, it initialized an empty git repository. So if I do an ll, I see that there is a folder called .git. Uh, if I do a git status, it tells me I'm currently in branch master. Uh, I have no commits and nothing to commit. Now we're not gonna cover a ton of git right now. Uh, we'll be working with it throughout uh, this course but we want to definitely get things kind of set up. So what are a couple of things that, that we need to do? Well, first off, and I'm going to reference my list, we did our git init, and I've mentioned bash rc. Now, one of the things that I have accidentally done is this time it says we're in git branch master. Well, if I come here, we can look at uh, git branching strategy, right? So there's lots of different strategies on how you should develop your uh, software and almost every occasion, it's gonna come down to how are you branching? How are you merging things back in? Uh, do you have a development line, a release line? How are you tagging things? We'll get into some of that. But the point is, is that you end up branching to work on something for some period of time, and then you merge it back into whatever your main branch is, your master branch is, whatever you're calling it these days. Um, the point is, is that you make your commits out on some branch to develop it, to test it, to do whatever, and then you bring it back to some point where you're gonna release that software, right? And that's where maybe other developers can finally get a look at what you've done uh, and you know make comments. You know, however, again, you do your strategy. The point is, is there's going to be multiple branches, and you want to make sure when you're making your changes, you're on the correct branch, the branch that you think you're on. Well, I could be typing away, blah blah blah, doing all my kind of stuff, and forget that I never actually branched, and I'm still on in this case, master. And that might not be what you want. So one of the things I do to kind of protect myself a little bit is I want to update my prompt to indicate which branch I'm currently in at all times. So to do that, we're gonna update our Vim RC file. Now, there's a, lot, there's a couple different ways to do it. Um, so this is one article that somebody did where they updated theirs with parse git branch. Um, I've seen a couple different ways of doing it. I'll show you the way that I do it. So if I do a VI, uh, go into my home directory, this should be uh, bash rc. So this is a big old file um, that specifies a lot of different things, but I'll do the slash forward slash ps1. This is gonna search for ps1. And so I see here that I do have a PS1 entry. And all of this crazy, look, this is what builds that prompt, right? 
So what I want to do is I'm going to comment this out and then I'm going to specify a new one. And if I copy from the one I typically use, there it is, let me copy. And I will control shift V into here. And what we see is it's pretty much the exact same thing all the way up till this point. At that point, I actually insert that. All right. So the other one, uh, the other example that we saw was using uh, git or parse git branch. I've been using uh, underscore underscore git underscore ps1 for a while and it has worked well for me. Um, and then I end up adding a carriage return and then a special arrow character. Now to get that character to show up, I actually have to bring it in. So let me copy, come back here, control shift V to paste. And what I have is some Unicode. So these are, this is hexadecimal representation of a Unicode character for an arrow, right? If that doesn't make any sense to you, hopefully as we go through the C course, you'll see me using some hex um, and it'll make a little bit more sense. But essentially, I'm specifying the bytes that makes up the arrow, all right? And so because I've specified it here and I'm saying I want the arrow after the carriage return, what I should see if I hit escape, colon WQ to write, I will source so that it rereads this file my prompt changes and now I not only indicate uh, which uh, branch I'm in but it gives me a little bit extra space by dropping me down a line now what I found especially since I'm way zoomed in uh, so that you can kind of see if I'm a couple folders deep my prompt might be way out here and so I'm trying to type a command in here and that'll turn into garbage because it'll wrap around and it's just kind of a pain. So I did that whole uh, git or underscore underscore git underscore ps1, that carriage return, that slash n, and then my arrow, a space, and then that regular prompt. And so this will change if I'm a root user or a standard user. But essentially now, every time I hit enter, it, it always drops me and gives me that line below. And I know at any time, just looking at the terminal, what branch I'm in, which I find to be super helpful. Okay, so that's uh, that. So we've gotten through our bash RC. Let's go ahead and set up some SSH keys. Um, actually, we can also do a uh, git config uh, because we wanna make sure that uh, our git is working correctly when we uh, start making actual commits. So let's go ahead and do that now. So if we do a git config, we'll do a dash dash list. And what we see is by default, these are a couple of different settings that are applied to git. Now, honestly, I'd have to look up to see what these do. I don't even know offhand. Uh, but what I'm looking for is I want it to identify me whenever I make a commit. So these couple of settings, these are actually specified in our, our .git folder. So if I cat.git slash config, that's where those are coming from. So these actually reply, or apply to just the repository that we're in. But since I'm gonna be the only developer on this machine, I wanna set some changes at a higher level so that it will apply to every um, repository that I make. Every project that I work on, I want it to be uh, done at that higher level. And so if we do a uh, look at the manual page for git config, what we'll see if I do a slash slash or a slash uh, dash dash uh, global is I can apply some settings at a system level. So the entire machine at a global level, which is basically 
you know, at that user level. Uh, and then I can also have it at a, a local level, which is where those settings were that I just showed you. It's four lines. I didn't really know what they did. Those are applied to that local level. So they're only for the repository. But instead, I can set some things at a global level. And so you can do a git config dash dash global and then start specifying what you want. I think there's a user dot email equals blah, 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 right? So I could do that or I already, I know where the file is going to get created. So I'm just going to go ahead and make that file myself. So I'll do a VI home directory git config. All right. And then if I look at um, my example, I've got here what I typically see in it. If I do an I for insert, I can do for my user, tab in one, and I'll do email equals ron.wellman01 at gmail.com. I can do name equals Ron Wellman. And I'll do one more. I'll do core. And I also like to do editor equals VI. And so what this is saying is, hey, there are times where I may make a commit, but I didn't actually specify a message. Well, then Git's going to prompt me for a message. And if it does that, I want it to do it inside the VI editor. All right. That's all that says. But the most important things here is this user portion to make sure it identifies me when I make a commit, All right? So if I colon WQ for right quit, now if I do a git config dash dash list, I now see that it grabbed it from that higher level, um, my email and my name and my editor of choice, All right? So again, I could have specified that with git config dash dash global, uh, user dot email and, and did it that way uh, but instead I can just best you know write it out in the file uh, and it works just as well so now I know when I make a commit it's going to be marked as coming from me which is important because you know in your history of all the changes to your file you want to know who made that change um, and by doing that I'm gonna mark it as I made that change all right so let's see, so we did our git config, let's do some SSH keys. So git, uh, I can use it at, as a local kind of thing, but usually I'm working with other um, developers, right? I'm probably not the only developer working on this project. And so typically you'll have some kind of uh, repository that's hosted somewhere so that all the developers can get to it. Now, I'm going to be using GitHub in these uh, in this series, but you might just as well use GitLab. Um, I've also used uh, the Atlassian suite, and they have something called GitBucket. Um, so I've used a couple different flavors of hosted uh, Git repositories, but you could host it yourself, right? Um, you're perfectly happy to do so. But in this case, I'll be using GitHub. And so when I talk to GitHub, I don't want to have to specify my username and password every time I try to push from my local machine to that remote repository. Instead, I want it to build a secure encrypted connection automatically. And so it's going to use SSH keys in order to do that. So if we go back to our uh, web browser, what we can find if we do a little bit of Googling is GitHub actually has a page that specifies uh, one way in order to create uh, some SSH keys. So we could copy this, go back to our terminal, I'll paste that in, and I'll specify my email. And it's gonna ask, okay, I can make that for you and I can save that key in your home directory under the hidden .ssh folder and I'll call it ID, you know, whatever. And you can change this. Uh, you can change the location, you can change the name. Um, I wouldn't recommend changing the location, but you can definitely change the name. 
In this case, I'm just going to leave it at the default. And then it's going to ask me if I want a passphrase. And this is basically like, okay, I'm going to lock your key until you need it. When you go to use that key, I'll prompt you for your passphrase. Once you enter your passphrase, you're not going to have to enter it again for that session. Meaning, until I log out or reboot, it's just going to work, right? So this is one way that you can kind of protect your SSH key. Uh, hopefully, so somebody else doesn't use it because uh, you accidentally, I don't know, put it in a directory that you weren't supposed to. You shared it even though you weren't supposed to. Um, so just a little bit of protection. Not a ton, but a little bit. Um, and so it's usually a good idea to do so. In this case, I'm not going to worry about it for simplicity. And so it's created the key. So if I look inside my home directory, .ssh, I see that there are two keys, right? One is a private key, one is a public key. Notice these are permissions that are applied to the file. So this is a owner, this is a group, and this is other. So notice only the owner can read and write to it. Nobody else can do anything to it. And this is important, right? You're, again, protecting this key. Oftentimes, SSH won't work if it's not very restrictive like this one is. Um, if for some reason you had copied some keys over and it came with some of the default uh, permissions, you would have to then change these permissions to be more restrictive. And so you might do that with chmod, uh, home.sh, id, uh, underscore ed, uh, I forgot to specify the actual number. So 25519, but we could do a 600. Right? So what this is saying is each of these are like binary things. So this is actually a four, this is a two, and this is a one. So you just end up adding up the ones that you want to set. So four plus two is six. And then because I'm not setting any of these, it's zero. And I'm not setting any of these, it's zero. And it's good. Right? And so those are the kinds of permissions that you want to see on your private key. Right? Well, in this case, they're fine. This is the public key, so everybody can read it. They just can't uh, make any changes to it, which is fine. So we want to cat out our public key. Dot pub. And we see this key right here. So we're going to copy this. And then we're going to go back to our browser and go to GitHub. So if you've created your GitHub account, up in the upper right hand corner, you can do drop down to settings. It'll bring you here and then you go to SSH and GPG keys. And then you would add a new key. You would do that and you would paste it right in there. Now I'm not going to do that because I already have keys. And so I'm just going to basically copy over my existing keys to this box and I should be good to go. All right. So if I go back to my terminal. I'm going to go ahead and delete these keys I just created because I'm just going to copy in my existing keys. So we're going to remove those keys. So we're empty. If I come here, I should be able to specify that I want to go home.ssh. I have nothing in that folder. So if I copy these from my main machine, copy them over. I now have two keys in there. Close that. So I have the keys that are restrictive. So that's good. Now, ordinarily, I would be fine at this point, right? If we go back to generating of keys, it does talk a little bit about doing this eval uh, and making sure it's added in so that each time you log in, those keys are available. I've rarely had to ever do that. So I'm not going to do it this time around. I've rarely had to do it. It usually just works, right? But in case it doesn't, those are your steps. It's right at the bottom of the same page that told you how to generate your key. So we go back to our terminal here. 
and we only have a single uh, set of keys in here. So they're basically the default keys that are gonna get used uh, by uh, Git when we try to uh, push to the repo. Now, on my main machine, I have multiple keys. I have keys because I have accounts at GitHub, I have accounts at GitLab, I have accounts at you name it. If I've had to work on a project with someone, I created a set of keys for it. So I probably have multiple sets of keys, which I do. So in order to uh, not confuse uh, Git uh, and SSH, we're going to tell it which keys to use when we connect uh, to GitHub. So to do that, we're gonna create a config file inside of this .ssh folder. So vi home directory .ssh config. And in here, I'm gonna hit I for insert, host, and we can name this whatever we want, but we'll just call it GitHub. I'm gonna specify a host name of github.com. If I could type. So this is the actual URL that we'll be visiting. And then we'll specify the key. Identity file. Oops. Man. Killing me, Smalls. All right. Dot SSH. And mine is called dot or ID RSA. Yours will be whatever you named yours. And we'll do user git. All right. So this says when I go and try to establish an SSH connection with github.com, use this key. All right. So I'll hit escape, colon WQ to write and quit, and we should be good to go. All right. So now uh, I think I can even get at uh, github.com. So it's going to ask me, since I've never gone here before, um, it's just trying to protect me a little bit. I'm gonna say yes. Because I specified a passphrase on the key that I'm using, it prompts me. And if I can type correctly, boom. So it said, hey, Ron Wellman. So it identified me. You successfully authenticated, but GitHub, GitHub does not provide shell access. So again, one way for us to kind of just validate that uh, the key that we created that identified us and the key that we then added into our profile uh, on GitHub, they both lined up and it identified me correctly. Okay, so that's good. So we know our key's good. So when we need to push to our repository, we know that that will work correctly. All right, cool, cool, cool. All right, so we did our SSH keys, we did our SSH config. Now let's go ahead and create a repository. So locally we've made a, a Git repository, but let's say that uh, we didn't wanna do it this way. So we'll do rm.rf, so we're gonna delete this folder. So we're no longer in a repository. Instead, let's go back here. We'll go back to uh, Git. And I think I already have um, a repo for this. Let's see. Rediscover C. There we go. So this is from one of the videos I tried to do before, but had some power outages and all that kind of goodness. We're gonna go ahead and clone this. We'll make an update to it and push it and see what happens. So we hit our, clo or our code button, download code, SSH. So we're gonna copy this out. Go back to our terminal, git clone, control shift V to paste it in there and boom, it's downloaded, right? So it went, it used our SSH key to build a connection to it. It went ahead and cloned it. And so now we see we have this folder, rediscover C. 
And if we look inside, we have a dot .git, we have a dot .git ignore, and we have a readme. Now where did some of these files come from? Well, they were automatically created for us. So if I do uh, plus up here and I do a new repository, it would allow me to specify a repository name. I can specify whether I want this thing to be public or private. In my case, I'm going to make it public so that if you're watching and you want to follow along with these videos, all the code will be hosted here. I went ahead and checked add a readme and I checked add a git ignore and then I specified that I wanted this to be a template from C, right? And then I just went ahead and created the repository. So too easy. That created that basic setup. Well, what is in those files? So if we look, this is markdown. The pound here, uh, single pound makes it you know large. This is kind of for your header and then some kind of description underneath, right? So typical repository will have readme describing, hey, this is what this repository does, this is what it's for, all those good things. Maybe this is how you build my project. Uh, here's how you contribute. Lots of stuff you can kind of put in here. Well, this git ignore file is a little bit different and it's a little bit larger. So I'll do less git ignore. So this is basically, I mean, it's exactly what it says. It's going to ignore files that end in the extension .d, .o, .ko, so on and so forth. So a lot of times as you're building a project, there are artifacts that are generated when you compile, but they're not source code. So you really don't want them to end up in your repository, right? Because they're gonna just get regenerated the next time somebody compiles it. So again, you don't wanna add those to your repository. So what this does is ignores those files. So even if there are changes to them, it just ignores it. It doesn't even show up uh, when you start looking at git status so you don't accidentally add it to your repository. This would also be a good place if you had a file that had maybe a password in it, some kind of secret. How about add it in here? So again, it further kind of protects you from accidentally adding it in a commit, all right? There are better ways of protecting secrets, but again, this might be just a step that you could take to kind of protect yourself. So in our case, uh, it's gonna ignore typical uh, files that get you know, created only during compilation. So in our case, we're just gonna update our readme here. So if we do our readme, uh, this project, this is a project to remind myself how to program in C. And hopefully help you as well. Now if I do a git status, what I see is that the readme file has been modified. So what we can do is git add readme, git status again. Now it says not only has it been modified, but it's awaiting uh, being committed. So we've added it or we've staged it. Now we're getting ready to commit it, right? So git commit, we'll specify a message. Oh, man, dated readme to include you. All right, obviously you wanna put something descriptive in here um, so that you go through the commit messages, it makes sense why this commit was made. All right, so this says uh, that uh, we did that. If we do a git log dash dash one line, I think we can see that initially I created uh, the repo. I updated it at some point for the readme. And then this is the most recent commit message, you know, updated readme to include you. So now this file has been saved locally in our repository. Our changes are, are 
uh, saved and committed, all, all that is good. But in order for other people now to see it, we need to push it to that remote repository. So git push. And by default, we only have one remote repository. Um, if I do a git uh, config dash dash list, uh, yeah. So we had made changes to our user and our core. These were a couple that came in by default. Now that we've cloned a repository, we identify something called origin, uh, remote origin. So that is GitHub, right? So when we did our git, com uh, git push, it pushed it to GitHub and it pushed it to my account and it pushed it to the rediscover C repository. All right. So if we go back and look here, if I hit back and I refresh this screen, what we should see is we now see the changes that we made. And if I look at my commit history, it identified me as the person that made those commits because we added our username and, and our email to our git config. Um, and so we're good to go, All right? So that's pretty much it for getting our development environment up. I think I'm at like 40 some minutes, so close to this. Um, but to recap, we installed um, VS Code. We installed the uh, C extension for VS Code. Uh, we installed Vim because it was a little bit nicer than just VI. We updated our Vim RC file uh, to set up Vim to be a little bit more uh, friendly. Uh, we talked about using plugins, so you're more than happy to go and do that if you want. We set up GDB uh, to be just a little bit nicer to us uh, when we have to disassemble or look at our code. Um, we also talked about using uh, Jeff or Geff. Um, again, if you're really doing some reverse engineering or something like that, those are almost a must have. But for our little bit of, uh, of um, testing our code, uh, or at least um, troubleshooting our code, the little bit of changes we made are just fine. Uh, we installed the GCC uh, compiler and went ahead and compiled our C program and ran it. We got Git running. So we installed Git, uh, we did a Git init, uh, where we created a local repository and just kind of checked it out. We updated our bash RC file to make it a little bit nicer so that we don't hopefully, you know, accidentally make commits to the wrong branch. Um, we updated our git config to identify us. So whenever we make a commit, it it's marked and signed as being from us. We set up our SSH keys in order to make uh, pushing into the remote repository a little bit easier. And then we created a, a new repository, cloned it down, made some changes, and pushed it up into GitHub. All right? So that, that pretty much ends getting our development environment up and running. I'm sorry it took so long, but there were it was a little bit involved from just getting from a bare uh, Ubuntu 20.04 uh, install up to something that we can now kind of work with and uh, you know, play around with the C programming language. So if you stuck with me this long, congratulations. Um, you're tough, or you have a lot of time on your hands. So again, thanks for watching, and uh, hope to see you in one of the next videos.